The four-month battle for the dominant peak of Monte Cassino was the grimmest of the whole Italian campaign. Three times the Allies assaulted it early in 1944. And three times they were flung back by the German defenders. Not until May 1944 was Monte Cassino finally captured. The flag that was hoisted over the monastery at its peak was Polish. The Polish troops who fought at Cassino had travelled a long way since their country was overrun by the Germans and Russians in September 1939. This crushing defeat was the beginning of a crusade to restore their nation's pride and independence. To continue the struggle, some had travelled thousands of miles from Siberian prison camps, down through the Caucasus and Persia to the Middle East. Others had escaped through Hungary and Romania. Their goal, to get to France, so as to continue their struggle against the Nazis. Once there, they formed a Polish army to fight alongside their traditional ally. When France was defeated, they continued their struggle from Britain. Fighting in all the major campaigns of the war in North Africa and Western Europe. The story of the free Polish forces is one of the epics of military history. It is also one which is little known. For a half century, the communist rulers of their country were happy to see these gladiators forgotten. Poland has always had a strong fighting spirit, born of centuries of conflict. In 1918, she regained her independence after nearly 150 years of Russian, Prussian and Austrian occupation. Almost immediately, the new republic was at war with the Russian Bolshevik regime. Although heavily outnumbered, the Poles snatched victory out of defeat in front of Warsaw in August 1920. This left a vengeful Russia on Poland's eastern border. And the creation by the Treaty of Versailles of a corridor of Polish territory that split East Prussia from the rest of Germany left Poland with an equally resentful Western neighbor. Thus the Poles had to maintain strong armed forces between the world wars. But they lacked the industrial base to provide these with sufficient modern equipment. When Hitler invaded on the 1st of September 1939, the Polish Air Force proved no match for the Luftwaffe with its state-of-the-art fighters. The small Polish Navy realized that it could do little against the German fleet in the Baltic. Three of its four destroyers were sent to Britain on the eve of war. The remaining surface warships were either destroyed by German bombers, scuttled or captured. Two Polish submarines managed to escape to Britain. Others were interned in neutral Sweden, together with their crews. The Polish army tried to conduct a delaying action in the vain hope that their British and French allies would launch a major offensive in the West. But they could do little against the German Blitzkrieg. With almost insane courage, Polish cavalry charged the German panzers. Inevitably, they were mown down. Any hope that the Poles might be able to hold out was dashed on the 17th of September, when the Russians invaded from the east, under an agreement made with the Germans just before the war. The Polish high command and government were forced to flee to Romania. There, under German pressure, they were interned. All Polish resistance by the regular armed forces ended on the 6th of October. The country was partitioned between Germany and the Soviet Union. 
hundreds of thousands of Polish servicemen were incarcerated in Soviet and German prisoner of war camps. Yet in spite of the disaster that had befallen Poland, its fighting spirit had not been crushed, and many thousands of troops were determined to fight on. These included not only professional soldiers, but men from all walks of life who had been conscripted when war threatened. Many were only teenagers. Many came from remote villages and had little knowledge of the wider world. But all were united in the belief that they must continue the struggle, no matter what the cost. As so often, the crisis brought forth the man, General Władysław Sikorski had been Prime Minister of Poland in the early 1920s, but had been retired after a coup in 1926. After the German occupation, Sikorsky set up a government in exile in France, which became a focus for his fleeing compatriots. An underground organization was set up to guide them via Romania, Hungary and Italy. Epic journeys were made on foot over hundreds of miles, often with little food or water. They were hunted as illegal immigrants by the countries through which they passed. In France, new units were formed for the men who got through. Trained Polish airmen joined the French Army of the Air. They quickly mastered flying French planes like the Doatine D-520 fighter. The ground troops were concentrated at Angers, in the Loire region of western France. There they were re-equipped and retrained, forming two divisions, an armoured brigade and an independent rifle brigade. These were placed under the command of the French army. Throughout the winter of 1939, General Sikorsky was tireless in his efforts to maintain the morale of his men. He knew that they would soon be in action again against their hated enemy, Nazi Germany. The Free Polish Forces first went into action in a totally unexpected place. For on the 9th of April, 1940, German forces invaded Denmark and Norway. The Allies responded by making landings to prevent the Germans from advancing northwards. Among the troops sent was the Polish independent Podolanska Rifle Brigade. This landed at the port of Narvik in the extreme north. The German forces which had landed there were eventually driven out but the Luftwaffe's total supremacy in the air made life increasingly difficult. Among the casualties was the Polish destroyer Grom, now serving with the Royal Navy. She had supported the operations at Narvik, but was sunk by German bombers on the 5th of May. Fortunately, most of her crew were rescued and got back to Britain to continue the struggle for a free Poland. The Allied forces held on until early June before withdrawing. The Poles returned to a France which was now facing total defeat. For the German assault which had begun on the 10th of May had swiftly led to the collapse of her armies. Two Polish divisions and an armoured brigade were in the French line as the German onslaught began. The second rifle division was in Alsace and was eventually driven back to the Swiss border. The French corps commander ordered his men to cross into Switzerland rather than surrender to the Germans. The Poles were interned and took no further part in the war. The 1st Grenadier Division was eventually surrounded in northeast France 
but its commander ordered his men to break out and make for Britain as best they could. In the air, Polish pilots fought desperately against the Luftwaffe, many for the second time. But it was an unequal struggle, and more than 10 pilots were lost. Determined to carry on the fight, General Sikorsky moved his government in exile to London. 24,000 of his men escaped as well. The Polish soldiers, still in their French uniforms, were sent to Scotland to be re-equipped. Soon they were wearing their third different uniform of the war and were impressing everyone with their smartness and enthusiasm. Scots living near the camps took the exiled Poles to their hearts, and many of them were to return to live there when the war was over. Members of the Polish Air Force had begun to arrive in Britain as early as December 1939, under an agreement made with the British government. They were incorporated in the Royal Air Force, and their ranks were swelled by those who escaped from France. After considerable pressure from Sikorsky, two wholly Polish RAF fighter squadrons were formed. They were 302 City of Poznan and 303 Kosciuszko squadrons. Both were involved in the Battle of Britain, while other Poles fought with RAF squadrons. They swiftly gained a reputation for a ruthless determination to destroy the enemy. Witold Urbanowicz was one of the top aces in the battle, with 17 confirmed kills. Another was Antoni Glavatsky, who shot down five German aircraft in one day. The 303 Squadron achieved 125 victories in the space of just five weeks fighting, making it the top scoring squadron in RAF Fighter Command. In all, 144 Poles flew in the battle. 29 lost their lives. Polish bomber squadrons flying Vickers Wellingtons joined RAF Bomber Command. Their crews were to fight throughout the four-year bomber offensive against Germany. The Free Polish Navy was strengthened by the handing over of seven British destroyers and two submarines, and later a cruiser. Polish ships fought in the Battle of the Atlantic and in the Mediterranean where the submarines earned the nickname the Terrible Twins from their exploits. Not all the Poles who escaped from their homeland ended up in Britain. Many had got through the Balkans and ended up in the French protectorate of Syria, where they were formed into the Carpathian Rifle Brigade. When France fell, the brigade crossed into Palestine and offered its services to the British. Under the command of General Stanislav Skopansky, it was re-equipped and trained on British army lines. And then in August 1941, the brigade was sent to the Libyan port of Tobruk. This had been under siege by General Irvin Rommel's Axis forces since April. The Poles defended Tobruk throughout the remainder of the siege. General Sikorsky visited them, eager to support the first of his ground forces to be back in action. When Tobruk was finally relieved in early December, 
the Polish brigade joined in the main British offensive which drove Rommel out of Cyrenaica. It was then withdrawn to refit, but the Carpathian Rifle Brigade would soon be joined by other Polish troops. Every member of the free Polish forces was continually aware of the suffering that their homeland was enduring under German and Soviet occupation. The Russians, determined that Poland should never regain its independence, deported many Polish soldiers and civilians to remote labor camps in Siberia. In Poland itself, resistance did not cease. An underground force, later known as the Home Army, was formed under Sikorsky's direction and took its orders from London. But on the 22nd of June, 1941, Poland's situation changed dramatically when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, bringing Stalin onto the Allied side. Sikorsky demanded that Moscow now release the Poles it was holding so that they could rejoin the war against Nazism. In July 1941, he signed an agreement in London with Soviet ambassador Ivan Maisky for a Polish army to be raised in Russia. General Vladislav Anders, the senior Polish officer in the Soviet Union, was released from the Lubyanka prison to command it. Anders set up his headquarters at Buzuruk, 600 miles south of Moscow. But bringing together his troops, who were scattered in camps throughout the Soviet Union, was a major problem. The Russians gave only minimal help. And as the winter closed in, Conditions for the Poles in Russia remained harsh. At the beginning of December 1941, as the German assault stalled in front of Moscow, Sikorsky traveled to the Russian capital to meet Anders and speak with Stalin. They obtained Russian agreement for the Poles to be transferred to the more temperate climate of Soviet Central Asia. But even then, the Russians continued to give little help, especially in supplying adequate rations. Sikorsky wanted the Polish army in Russia to fight with the Red Army on the Eastern Front, so that it could help liberate Poland. Anders, knowing the paranoia of Stalin, disagreed believing that his men would be more effective if they joined the British forces fighting in the Mediterranean. Eventually, the Russians agreed that a proportion of the Poles could go to the Middle East. Those who remained in Russia would eventually form the first Polish army, which fought alongside the Red Army. The first contingent of Poles left Russia in spring 1942. Their journey took them across the Caspian Sea and down through Iran, an odyssey of more than 2,000 miles. They finally arrived in Iraq, where the British had set up camps for them. A second contingent followed making a grand total of 115,000 soldiers and civilians. Named 2nd Polish Corps, Anders men were joined by the Tobruk veterans of the Carpathian Brigade. Among the members of 2nd Polish Corps was an unusual recruit, Wojtek, a brown Syrian bear cub. Hunters had shot his mother and he'd been picked up by members of an ammunition supply company. Wojtek swiftly adopted them as his family. He grew quickly and became a familiar sight in the company's lines. One of his favorite pastimes was wrestling with anyone rash enough to take him on. While the strength of the free Polish forces was being built up, the war in the Middle East swept on. 
In the autumn of 1942, the British defeated Rommel at El Alamein and pursued him through Libya and into Tunisia. Then in November, Anglo-US forces landed in French Northwest Africa and advanced into Tunisia, threatening to attack Rommel from behind. As the Allies in Tunisia wore down the Axis forces, the Polish troops in Britain and the Middle East became increasingly impatient to rejoin the war. It seemed as though the army had been forgotten. Even though free Polish ships continued to fight as part of the Royal Navy in the Battle of the Atlantic against Hitler's U-boats, and Polish merchant ships sailed in the convoys they guarded. Polish fighter and bomber squadrons were also busy. The bomber offensive continued, with the frequency of raids building up. One group of experienced fighter pilots, known as the Polish Fighting Team, was sent out to Tunisia under the command of Stanislaw Skalski, who had already had 15 victories to his credit. The team quickly impressed the RAF and became known as Skalski's Flying Circus. It accounted for 25 Axis planes in six weeks of combat. Then, in April 1943, as the campaign in Tunisia drew to an end, came a bombshell which severely threatened the Free Poles relationship with the Soviet Union. The Germans announced that they had discovered a mass grave of Polish officers in Katyn Wood in Western Russia, near Smolensk. Sikorsky knew that several thousand Polish officers in Russian hands could not be traced and was convinced that Moscow was to blame. The Free Poles in London asked Stalin for an explanation, but none was forthcoming. Worse, Stalin broke off relations with the London Poles and set up his own puppet Polish government in Russia. The British government, keen not to upset relations with their eastern ally, declined to give Sikorsky and his government in exile any support in the matter. As the row rumbled on, General Sikorsky set off on a tour of the free Polish forces in the Middle East. He was only too aware that their morale was suffering both from lack of action and the aftermath of the Katyn Wood discovery. As Sikorsky's tour ended, the free Polish cause was struck by a shattering tragedy. On the 4th of July, Sikorsky departed from Gibraltar to return to England in his B-24 Liberator. The plane had scarcely lifted off before it plunged into the sea. Sikorsky and his daughter were among those who died. The pilot survived and reported that the controls had failed to respond during takeoff. Sikorsky's body was recovered and brought back to England in a Polish destroyer to be buried at a cemetery in the Nottinghamshire town of Newark, where the Polish Air Force had its own burial plot. Officially, Sikorsky's death was put down to an accident, but ever since, Suspicions have remained that it came at a particularly convenient moment for the Soviet Union. Stanislav Mikolajczyk succeeded Sikorsky as Prime Minister 
while the Free Polish ground forces continued to train. But they would not have much longer to wait before getting back into action. The Allies had invaded Italy in September 1943. By the end of November, they had been brought to a halt by the formidable defenses of the German Gustav Line in the mountains south of Rome. The initial efforts to break through failed. It was now that General Vladislav Anders and his second Polish corps were ordered to move from Iraq to Italy to join the British Eighth Army. One recruit who was not prepared to be left behind was Wojtek, the soldier bear. He boarded a transport with his colleagues in the ammunition supply company and was given an official rank and paybook so that he could draw his rations. At last, for the free Poles, the fighting would get serious. They found the Italian winter a sharp contrast to their long stay in the Middle East, but they were given time to acclimatize. While they were doing this, the Allies decided to outflank the Gustav Line. Landings would be made at Anzio, some 30 miles south of Rome. These took place on the 22nd of January, 1944. Little opposition was met on the beaches, but failure to exploit this and advance immediately inland enabled the Germans to rush in reinforcements and contain the beaches. The failure at Anzio meant that the Allied commanders had to renew their efforts to break through the Gustav line. The key to the defenses was the town of Casino, which guarded the entrance to the Liri Valley, through which the road to Rome passed, and the hill with a monastery on top, which dominated it. At the end of January, the Americans tried to capture Monte Cassino, but failed. In the mistaken belief that the Germans were using the monastery as an observation post, the Allies then bombed it. German paratroops quickly took full advantage of the rubble in both the monastery and casino town to secure their defenses. They repulsed further Allied attacks in February and March, although the second, by Indians and New Zealanders, did manage to get into the town. General Sir Harold Alexander, commanding the Allied armies in Italy, now decided to wait until the ground had dried out after the spring thaw. In the meantime, he launched an air offensive against German road and rail communications. It was now that the Second Polish Corps was deployed in front of Casino. Its mission, to finally capture the mountain. On the night of the 11th of May, the Poles attacked. In spite of displaying desperate bravery, they were repulsed after two days' fighting. However, three French troops managed to make progress in the mountains on the southern side of the Liri Valley. Three days later, Marshal Albert Kesselring the German commander ordered a gradual withdrawal from the Gustav Line, beginning with the forces facing the Americans in the south. But the German paratroops defending Casino remained in position, confident that their dominating defenses would keep the Allies at bay. The Poles attacked again on the 17th of May and there was further desperate fighting before the 12th Podolsky Lancers closed in on the monastery itself the following morning. Among the troops spearheading the assault 
with Lieutenant Jurek Kowalski. Shortly after 10 o'clock, I entered the Casino Monastery with the 1st Polish troops, a famous Polish Lancer Regiment of the Carpathian Division. Only 17 Germans were left in the building and they surrendered to 2nd Lieutenant Gurbiel Kazimierz and his Lancers. Parts of the building were still standing. Rubble, equipment and soldiers' beds littered the inside of the monastery. Our division has not met the Germans since Tobruk and has been looking forward to this moment for two years. The Poles raised their national flag in triumph over the ruins. Within an hour, General Oliver Lees, the commander of the 8th Army, was at Anders headquarters and toasting him in Champagne. It had been a magnificent effort. But the Poles were not finished yet. They continued to drive along the north side of the Liri Valley, displaying great dash and determination. But their casualties were rising. They suffered some 3,800 killed and wounded in just two weeks of fighting. As a result, the Polish corps was pulled out of the line. In the days that followed, many distinguished visitors came to offer their congratulations to the Poles. These included General Alexander and King George VI. The reputation of General Anders and his men was now second to none. Wojtek too received his share of congratulations for his coolness under fire and his help in humping ammunition. He now became his unit's official symbol. Meanwhile, on the 5th of June, 1944, the Allies entered Rome. The Poles were soon back in action, taking part in the subsequent advance northwards. In July, they added the capture of the important Adriatic port of Ancona to their laurels. But by the end of 1944, the Allies were again stalled by the German defences, this time by the Gothic Line, running along the Apennine Mountains north of Florence. When they mounted their final offensive in April 1945, the Poles played a leading part, ending their war with the capture of the northern city of Bologna. Back in Britain, the Polish forces followed the exploits of their comrades at Casino with enormous pride. They too were impatient to rejoin the fight. There were two key fighting formations training for the liberation of Western Europe. One was the 1st Polish Armoured Division. The other was the independent Polish Parachute Brigade. The Polish ground forces did not take part in the Normandy landings or the subsequent fighting in the beachhead. But Polish ships were present off the beaches from D-Day onwards. Polish pilots were also in action in the skies over Normandy. One was Eugeniusz Horwaczewski, who had been one of the aces of Skalski's flying circus in Tunisia. He led the Polish 315 squadron in their Mustangs with great verve. 
But Horbachevsky was shot and killed during an epic dogfight with Fokovov FW-190s on the 18th of August. His squadron claimed 16 German planes down for the loss of three of their own. By this time, the 1st Polish Armour Division had arrived in France and become part of the 1st Canadian Army. It soon moved into action. Following the American breakout from Normandy at the end of July, a major part of the German forces became trapped in the Falaise area. Massive air attacks pounded the German troops. The Canadians were given the job of sealing the Falaise pocket. And their attack was spearheaded by the Polish Armoured Division. Although it was the first time they had been in action in their tanks, they fought like veterans. Within three days, the pocket had been closed, and more than 50,000 dazed and shocked Germans were taken prisoner. Falaise ended any hope for the Germans that they could conduct an orderly withdrawal through France. Over the next three weeks, the tanks of the Polish division roared across northern France in a high-speed pursuit which took them through Abbeville and on to Ypres in Belgium. Finally, they liberated the Dutch town of Breda, where they were given a memorable welcome by the inhabitants. But shortly afterwards, overstretched supply lines brought an end to the rapid Allied advance. Meanwhile, back in Britain, the Polish Parachute Brigade was still eagerly awaiting its baptism of fire. Its men, and every other free Pole involved in the Allied advances in the West, were very aware that a desperate struggle was now raging in their homeland. By late July 1944, the great Soviet counteroffensive had driven the Germans back over the Polish border and was closing in on Warsaw. It was the moment that the Polish Home Army, the armed underground force, had been waiting for. On the 1st of August, the Poles in Warsaw rose against their hated Nazi occupiers. But on the previous night, the Red Army had halted its offensive. A delegation of London Poles immediately went to Moscow to plead for the offensive to be resumed, but Stalin refused. He had already installed his own Polish administration at Lublin and told the London Poles that there could not be two governments in exile. Likewise, he refused to allow US and British aircraft to use Russian bases to drop supplies to the Home Army. The battle for Warsaw continued, with the Poles becoming ever more desperate. The Polish Home Army fought on throughout August and September, and it was not until early October that the Germans finally crushed all resistance. While the fighting was at its height, the Polish Parachute Brigade begged that it should be dropped into Warsaw to help its compatriots. The request was turned down by the British government, on the grounds that not only would it be suicidal, but the brigade was at last about to be sent into battle. They were to take part in Operation Market Garden, General Montgomery's ambitious plan to seize bridges over waterways in Holland so as to outflank Germany's main natural obstacle in the West, the River Rhine. The Poles were to drop at Arnhem to provide reinforcement for the British 1st Airborne Division. But the Polish airborne commander, General Stanislaw Sosobowski, objected to the plan. 
He believed that the 48-hour interval between the first British drop and that of the Poles was too wide. Sosobovsky's objections were ignored because there were not enough aircraft and gliders to deploy his troops more quickly. The operation went ahead on Sunday, the 17th of September, 1944. The British Paris succeeded in getting into Arnhem, but were pinned down by two German Waffen-SS divisions and unable to secure the bridge over the Lower Rhine. To make matters worse, fog delayed the Polish drop, and they did not arrive until four days after the initial landings. By that time, the German forces around Arnhem had been much strengthened, and the lightly equipped British paratroops were under increasing pressure. The Poles landed on the south bank of the Lower Rhine, and only about 250 men were able to get across the river to reinforce their British comrades. The next day, troops from the 30th British Corps managed to link up with Sosobovsky's men, but it was too late to alter the situation at Arnhem. Some of the British and Polish paratroops did manage to get back across the river. But the majority were forced to surrender to the Germans. The failure to secure the bridge at Arnhem meant that the last chance for the Allies to end the war in Europe before the end of 1944 had gone. The 1st Polish Armoured Division spent the autumn on the River Maas. It then took part in the grim winter battles to clear the approaches to the River Rhine. The Poles took part in the final Allied advance into Germany, and First Armoured Division's war ended with the capture of the port of Wilhelmshaven. They were still 350 miles from the Polish border, but it was the nearest that the Free Poles got to their country. Unlike the other Allies, the Free Poles reacted to the end of the war in Europe with mixed feelings. They had hoped that their great contribution to victory would result in their country regaining its independence. But it was not to be. The Western Allies had agreed that Poland would be in the Soviet sphere of influence. And when Soviet troops liberated the country from the Germans, Stalin was able to ensure that the pro-Moscow Polish Lublin government was installed in power, and Red Army troops were stationed in the country. The hopes of the Free Poles were dashed, and they were left in a dilemma over what to do. Nevertheless, half of those who had fought with the Western Allies did decide to return home to be reunited with those of their loved ones who had survived the war. As the communist grip on Poland tightened, many of them were to be arrested, murdered, or deported to the Soviet Union. The remainder of the Free Poles settled in the West, most of them in Britain, and made new lives for themselves. Among them was Wojtek, the soldier bear. On the demobilization of his unit, he set up home in Edinburgh Zoo, where he still remembered. Here he lived, often visited by his former comrades, until his death at the age of 22. Throughout the Cold War, the exiled free Poles continued to live in hope that their country would once more be free. Their dreams were finally realized in 1989, when the communist government was defeated in a general election by Lech Wałęsa and his reformist Solidarity Party. This was followed by the breakup of the Soviet Union and the withdrawal of its forces from Poland.
Then, in September 1993, the remains of General Vladislav Sikorsky finally left Newark, where they had lain for 50 years, and were taken back to Poland to be reburied in Kraków, seat of the ancient kings of Poland. The free Polish dream had finally been realized. Today, among the many memorials to the free Polish forces, who gave so much for so little, there are two that stand out. One is the memorial to the Polish Air Force at Northolt on the outskirts of London. The other is a statue of General Sikorsky himself, which was unveiled in 2000 and stands outside the Polish Embassy in London. Its simple inscription commemorates not just him, but all who fought in the free Polish armed forces and in the resistance movement. They were all gladiators, prepared to sacrifice everything for the cause of their country. <laughs>